Can I welcome you all to the 12th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda item four in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. That's agreed. Agenda item two is new powers arising from the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. And today we'll take evidence on that. As outlined in our meeting papers, revised analysis published by the UK Government in April lists 111 areas where EU law and devolved competence intersects. Within these policy areas, a number have been identified where common frameworks between devolved and UK administrations may be required. These include public procurement, which is an area of interest to the local government sector. Our papers also mention structural funding. While it is not identified as a common framework in the UK Government's analysis, it is an area where the UK Government have proposed a UK-wide shared prosperity fund to replace the current EU funds. Local Government currently plays a role in distributing funds. The evidence session today will therefore cover these two issues in more detail, and I would like to welcome Councillor Alison Everson, President of COSLA, Julie Wells, Director of Scotland Excel, Gordon McLaren, former Chief Executive ESEP Limited and Malcolm Leach, Chair of European Funding Subgroup, Scottish Local Authorities Economic Development Group. And I'd like to start off by asking you uh, all two things. One is the areas of most concern to local government were common frameworks you think will need to be established. And when you're responding to that, I suppose, with the obvious exception of Alison Everson, if you could maybe explain a bit of what your organisation does and what its role will be in this process. Would anybody like to start off? I'll start. That would be helpful. Thank you, Julie. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Julie Welsh. I'm the director at Scotland Excel. Um, Scotland Excel is a shared service across 32 local authorities. Um, we do all the shared procurement, um, including things like care, um, food in schools, books in schools, um, bins, any number of things we do it. Um, our contract portfolio at the moment sits about £1 billion. Um, over and above that, we provide learning and development um, to our council members to help them to get better at procurement and commercial skills as well. Um, in terms of the areas of most concern, um, what is being proposed at the moment is, doesn't make a massive change, actually, to what we currently do. Um, there are some renaming of things. So at the moment, we have what we call the ESPD, um, the European Single Procurement Document. That will change to the SPD, um, the Single Procurement Document. Um, at the moment, we would advertise everything via Public Contract Scotland, and that would automatically go to ODU basically. Um, the UK government has set up a new online tool, which means that we can still use PCS, Public Contract Scotland, but it will go to the new tool. Um, so for us at the moment, um, in terms of the legislation, um, there isn't a huge change in terms of what we, we will be doing, certainly in the short term. That applies to both a deal or a no deal. Um, bigger concerns for us actually are around currency fluctuations, supply chain risk and, and things like that, um, which we have been spending a lot of time uh, over the last uh, years working with our supply chain to attempt to mitigate. And on the whole, um, they are reasonably well prepared, although um, I would caveat that by saying kind of depends on what, <laughs> what we end up doing. Um, but, but they are reasonably well prepared, um, and that's in part to the work that we do with them and our member councils do with them. Thank you. Alison? Our major concern is, is to keep the influence and involvement in development of, of policies the same as we do now. At the moment, COSLA has a, a strong voice within Europe. We have a strong voice in the development of policy. And a lot of our work is very much involved in in the work that's decided in Europe. Things like um, community, consumer protection, food safety, environmental influence and power policies are all very much things that we have a voice in at the moment within Europe. And we would like to see that continue moving forward through any common framework. So our major concern is that we still have that voice. We still have that voice for our communities, for what's going on in our local areas. That particular principle of subsidiarity is really important to us, and we need to make sure that that's continued moving forward. Um, in particular, there are 64 of the powers that are being returned to, from the EU to the UK, 64 of them, because they're assessed as being 
local government concerns, things like the environment in particular are local government concerns, and at the moment we have a, a key role in those. So we'd like to see some kind of framework developing that Scottish government has a key role in it, but also local government has a key role in moving forward, again on that principle of subsidiarity. And that is a key aspect of what we're doing. We need as well to make sure that in things like procurement coming back to the UK, obviously procurement already is devolved in many ways, but we're, we're working within the EU. We have an opportunity here to allow local councils to buy local. We have an opportunity to allow councils to pay the living wage. And we need to make sure that we have a voice at that table to make sure that things like that can happen to the benefit of local government and to our local councils as well. A lot of um, council work is involving trade in procuring, involving buying services, involved in, in working with, with trade deals as well. At the moment, the system that's being proposed doesn't allow local government to have a say in what's happening with trade deals. Neither the UK government nor Scottish government has involved local government at that stage in that kind of work. And we would like to ensure that following again that principality of principle of subsidiarity, we have a key role in that kind of work as well. So I think this relates very strongly to the work we are doing with the Scottish Government in many ways. Uh, we are hopefully going to see the Charter of European Self-Government coming, coming into law at, at some stage very soon now, and that will enshrine those principles of subsidiarity. We are working very closely on empowerment of local communities, and this is a way we can develop systems here to allow that still to happen. And basically, it's that Team Scotland approach. Local government has a key role in trade, environmental work, in procurement, and we need to have a system through the common frameworks that allows that to happen. Mike, Mike Russell has himself used the phrase no detriment and I think that's key to what we're doing. We need to see no detriment to the current position of local government. Okay, thank you very much. Malcolm. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, the Scottish Local Economic Development Group, Slade for short, uh, and so it's not the 70s heavy rock band, uh, for some of the more mature members of the committee you might remember. Uh, Slade <laughs> uh, uh, consists of all 32 uh, local authorities in Scotland. It is an officer network uh, comprising uh, officers uh, in the economic development services of each council. It works very closely with, with COSLA uh, on matters of mutual interest and is basically the sort of uh, uh, the repository of technical expertise in the area of local authority economic development. In terms of the sort of subject matter uh, for this morning, there are perhaps two sort of areas where the issue of, of uh, uh, potential EU common frameworks following Brexit uh, would be of direct relevance to local authority economic development services. These are firstly the state aid uh, framework that would, uh, would arise uh, should uh, there be a Brexit, uh, and that would in turn would depend on the style of Brexit that might happen. And secondly, the other factor which you alluded to in your introductory remarks is about uh, European funding, in particular uh, the European structural funds, which uh, Scottish local authorities have made very extensive, and I would say good use of, over a very, very long number of years. Gordon. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'm maybe slightly the odd one out here. Um, <laughs> I used to be the chief executive of ESEP Limited. It was one of the independent program management, management executives that managed uh, the administration and disbursement of European structural funds up until 2012. Um, and so my, my approach to, to this is, is one of obviously huge dismay at the whole issue of Brexit and the impact that it's gonna have but wanting to see some level of continuity of structural funds, because I think they've been a force for good, um, it's certainly in Scotland. And indeed, Scotland has a huge reputation in the delivery of structural funds, both at the operational level, but also at the policy level across Europe. Uh, I worked for a time in the Commission, uh, in addition to, to managing structural funds in, in Scotland. Um, so my, my comments are perhaps more about delivery um, and the importance of delivering, the importance of partnership working in that delivery. And as Malcolm and, and my, my other colleagues here uh, have spoke of, local authorities have played a huge role in taking up, delivering, um, and successfully um, delivering projects on the ground. 
So they've always been a key partner, and from the very early days of structural funds, um, they were a key player. But partnership, as it evolved uh, in, in structural funds context, and particularly at a, an all Scotland level, um, was an equitable um, dimension. And it was important in the job that we did in managing structural funds to make sure that, that it was a genuine equitable partnership, that everyone had a say in both the development of the programme priorities, uh, the delivery and the processes that, that, were, that were required in terms of adjudicating and deciding which projects would go forward. So for me, partnership is absolutely key. I think the other thing is accountability. Uh, and I, I, I obviously read through the other supporting papers. But people have, in, over time, have forgotten the issue of accountability and it needs to be acknowledged that these are public funds, taxpayer funds, uh, and it's beholden on all of us uh, involved in the management and delivery of these funds that they are, they are delivered in an effective and successful way. And also in a compliant way, and, and you, you'll have read in, in, in innumerable times the complaints about the administrative burden uh, that goes along with structural funds. There is a huge resp contingent responsibility. Um, the audit regime is, is perhaps extreme. Um, I'm not going to defend that for a minute, but I, it, it, there has to be a balancing act going forward that says you know, we have to be accountable on how these funds, whatever we call them, are going to be dispersed in the future. Um, people need to understand that they, they, they have to behave responsibly, they have to account for how the money is spent, and it needs to be compliant in the context of procurement, uh, state aids and, and the like. Now, the state aid regime post-Brexit um, obviously is one that the UK will establish. Uh, but it's still important nonetheless that we, we don't support something uh, at a, a, a regional, sub-regional level that distorts local competition. Um, we need to remember that that uh, is, is fundamentally important. Uh, the last thing I would just say quickly is um, an issue called capacity building. And if you look at t structural funds programmes over the years, there is a budget line in the financial envelope called technical assistance. And within that, that refers to capacity building in terms of the administrative arrangements in delivering structural funds. It also includes things like uh, evaluation and monitoring and, and IT systems. But I just want to make a comment on that in as much as that was largely what we did and we were funded by technical assistance in managing the programmes. And there has to be a proactive approach to supporting um, uh, bodies that draw down structural funds. And if there's any delay in, in, in spend and in commitment levels, then you have to take a proactive approach. Uh, and uh, I, I note that it's slightly concerning that we've already had to return significant sums of money to the Commission, who I may say don't want to have the, receive the money back. They want to see it invested. Uh, but money is being lost. And I think going forward, that issue of capacity building uh, in terms of both lead bodies, um, the administration uh, arrangements that may be put in place um, is key. And, to, and technical assistance represents a maximum of 2% of the total financial envelope. We never ever used uh, the, the full amount of 2%, but I would suggest, <coughs> excuse me, that that's maybe something that's taken into consideration in the future. OK, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Annabel? Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, just picking up a few of the points already, I know uh, colleagues have got more detailed questions. Really, we've kind of, I, I suppose, in very broad brush, covered m many of the areas that we wish to, to look at in more detail this morning. But picking up on a few things at this stage, so I note that Councillor Evanson um, stated that... Uh, COSLA was working with the Scottish Government as Team Scotland, and it's part of your normal work with, with the Scottish Government. Um, and, and, you know, making the point, quite rightly, that local government's role uh, in uh, these areas, including, of course, the important uh, role of the, the, the structural funds and social funds, um, should be respected. But I just wonder, in terms of what we understand thus far, which is we know very little about what the UK government's planning to do, is that it might be the 
EU, the Westminster Housing Communities and Local Government Department that could be responsible for administering these funds. And I just wonder how you feel that would fit in with respecting the role of local government uh, as regards structural funds and social funds, which would be part of this shared prosperity fund. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's clear that the role of local government will change. I think the common framework should involve us having more of a relationship with the UK government than we do at the moment. At the moment, we work very closely with the Scottish government and we work with Europe. And we have very few connections with the UK government. I suspect the way things are moving, that that will change. And we will also have to have some kind of relationship, more involvement on all these levels with the UK government. Uh, last year, we welcomed the announcement of the UK government that they would create a consultative me uh, mechanism between the UK and local government, between our, our partner local government organisations in England, in Wales and Northern Ireland as well, a partnership, a consultative arrangement whereby we could discuss policies and we could develop things that were of mutual concern to all of us and develop policies before they got to the stage even of the Queen's speech. Unfortunately, that was promised, but nothing's developed from it. There is, there is no movement on that apart from the initial promise last year. But that, that kind of involvement will become crucial. And obviously, we would argue very strongly that a similar arrangement needs to be made formally at the Scottish level as well, that we need to be working, yes, we do have a developing partnership relationship with, with the Scottish Government, with ministers from, from across the table in Scotland, but something more formalised, I think, would have to come as part of these common frameworks. And at the moment... The UK government's promised but not delivered, and the Scottish government, we're still talking about it. So there's, there's pr improvement to be made on both levels of that, uh, that work and across all spheres of government. But you're right, we will need a closer relationship, I imagine, with the UK government as well as with the Scottish government. Thank you. And can I just pick out, and maybe some other members of the panel might want to chip in. I mean, obviously, um, I mean, the Scottish government would be keen to be uh, as uh, open, transparent and c collaborative as possible. But if you don't have the clarity about what on earth the policy is, it's, it puts a few uh, challenges perhaps uh, in the way of that at this stage. I was disappointed to hear that the UK government is still not able to provide any real information, nor is it, uh, does it appear that it is working really with anybody to seek to, to move this agenda forward. And obviously the Queen's speech, I think, has been delayed now to the autumn. So um, in the meantime, what do other members of the panel see as being a way forward? Because uh, time is marching on and we still have no clarity at all whatsoever <laughs> about any of the key issues with regard to the successor to the structural fund and the social fund. Yes, Mr. Leach. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you're uh, uh, raising some points that I think many of us in local government and particularly in the field of economic development share on that. Uh, one, of the, one of the defects uh, uh, about the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is not just the lack of detail, but the fact that there's no sort of guarantees that it's going to be an enduring part of the landscape beyond a certain given, say, spending round. And uh, we're certainly in local government aware that you know, within the UK, within Scotland, there are big disparities in regional economic development, in regional economic labour markets. And for long, as long as these exist in the UK, there is a need for a regional policy that needs to be underpinned at a somewhat higher level than just a, a short-term, three, four-year uh, uh, spending package. So one of the things that many of the correspondents to some of your sister committees' inquiries into aspects of the subject have made over the past year or so has been the need for a long-term perspective one that isn't just contingent on one particular spending round and one that has some sort of degree of permanence to it. Because in a way, it's important to note that the European Structural Fund regulations are, are regulations, so they directly apply in UK law. Once that's moved, removed, there is no, at the moment, there is, as I understand the situation, there is no proposal to replace that legal framework with anything uh, to replace it. And that is a sort of weakness and would... As I say, what's happened is that we had UK regional policy right from the 1930s onwards, underpinned by primary legislation, beginning with the Special Areas Act 1934, and mo moving on to various iterations over the 50 years or so thereafter. But that was being increasingly subsumed by EU uh, legislation in the area of structural funds, in the area of regional state aid, for example. So in a sense, we have our, 
a approach to regional development in the UK that is ultimately predicated on direct legislation originating from the European Union. And that is what gives a degree of certainty. Uh, my colleague Gordon, who's an old friend of mine, you know, did allude to some of the technical difficulties. The EU policy has changed. We all have had our complaints with it, but at least we all had the certainty it would be there. That uh, we may have had complaints about you know, whether this area got a priority and another area didn't. We may have had complaints about what you were allowed to spend the money on. You may have had complaints about what the grant rates were. But at least you knew that if the success of seven-year cycle, the policy would be there in some shape or form. And that's a risk of a lack of a framework for that sort of activity uh, that we face as local government at the moment in the economic development sphere. Yeah. <coughs> Mr. McLaren. Sorry, I think Mr. McLaren had a question. Um, sorry. Uh, just really to echo um, some of Malcolm's comments. Again, just going back a little bit in the history, if, you, if, you, if you'll indulge me for a moment. And, Malcolm's right, the regulations are set by, by, by the EU, the, the Commission services then set the high level priorities at the policy level, but I mean, do remember as a member state, we all have discussed these ad infinitum at different committees in Brussels, so everyone's member state, UK included, has signed up to these high level development priorities. What then happens uh, at the kind of sub-national level, for example, in Scotland, we, ha we had a fair latitude uh, to develop uh, within that overarching framework of uh, development themes, the kind of issues that we wanted to kind of uh, pursue and prioritise. And yes, there was a huge debate in terms of how the money would be uh, dispersed at a territorial level. Um, but we worked those out, and we were able to do that at, at, at an all-Scotland level, and we didn't necessarily have a white hall breathing down our neck, which was the case in the early days. And we had a very good and very uh, constructed relationship with the European Commission, with the Commission services, and we could deal with them directly. Um, so the negotiations that we had in the past leading up to a new programming period uh, went generally pretty smoothly. We were talking to them very early on, we were learning lessons of the current programme, what worked, what didn't work, which, which way we wanted to go. Um, sadly, that's been lost for a variety of reasons, but we've always had very good and very, very supportive relations at the Commission level. And I guess what I'm saying here is that uh, whatever happens, Brexit does take place and suddenly we don't have that safety net, as it were, of the EU regulations actually still um, allowing us to go forward with a regional policy. And it was the EU, remember, that brought in the whole concept of regional development and regional policy. That we should continue that. And in a sense, um, and it's easy for me to say now because I'm retired, um, but it's within Scotland's kind of gift, in a sense, to actually take the initiative and say, well, well actually, we, we've got this kind of headline, the Shared Prosperity Fund, but what, what would we want to do? If we had, had a level of continuity in terms of eight, nine hundred million euros. What would we do with that money? And we have the... the we, I know this is a kind of a local authority uh, perspective, and it, it, it's been the, the, the biggest player in structural funds because it's the greatest knowledge base, but they work closely with other economic actors and including the third sector. So getting people to come together and coming up with a kind of joint vision of where the priorities would be and, what, and, and how we'd want to direct that funding. And it might be big ticket uh, initiatives, like the broadband rollout, whatever, I'm slightly behind the time, support for renewables. But I, I guess what I'm saying is we shouldn't just wait. And certainly in the past, uh, we were generally always well prepared in Scotland because there was always a push coming politically from local government, from Scottish enterprise, from universities. Well, you know, what's, what's coming up next? What is it we, we, we need to do? So, thank you. Um, thank you. Very I, I just, to, very briefly, convener, just to, to make the point that there isn't any commitment about funding yet at all, albeit that wouldn't preclude a conversation. And I do take the point Ms McLaren makes, but, you know, there are key steers that would facilitate a, a useful conversation. And we don't have that because Westminster is not engaging. Uh, and as I say, nor is there a plan for a Queen's speech till the autumn. Uh, uh, and just picking up on the state aid point, um, state aid is not reserved, it's not in Schedule 5, state aid is devolved. 
and that would be the legal perspective. Okay, thank you. Andy, sorry, would you want to come in there? If it is very briefly. Um, well, I, I just think my, my question was around funds, and that seems to have been what Annabelle Ewing has been asking about, so it may follow on from that. It's up to you, convener. Uh, no, we'll, we'll come in later on. Right. Annabelle's was a more general yeah. question, I think, about other stuff. Andy? Uh, thanks um, very much. Um, uh, I just want to talk about procurement and, to an extent, perhaps state aids as well. I missed Annabel Ewing's past last comment. I'm not sure if she's saying that state aids has devolved. It's, it's not, it doesn't appear as reserved in Schedule 5. Everything that is not reserved is devolved. That is the rule of the yeah, Scotland. I understand that. It's the position of the UK government that it is um, reserved. It's also the position of the Scottish government that it is um, reserved. It's not the um, position of the Sorry, the position yeah, of the Scottish Government is that it is devolved. It is very, and they have been in contact with the UK Government on many, many occasions to make that point. Right, OK. Just, just, got on, just got on with it. OK, I don't want to have an argument about this. I mean, the, there is... There is... <laughs> that's not what I'm reading in Scottish Government guidance. Um, the, the point is, is there's, there's, a, there's a dispute about that. The UK Government takes a different view. I mean, that's... Um, <laughs> So let's come back to state aids, but I want to talk about procurement. Alison, you talked about procurement possibilities. Now, procurement is one of these areas where um, it's been identified there to be a non-legislative common framework. And as I understand it from Derek Mackay's letter to the Economy Committee, all parties um, have now agreed that there doesn't need to be legislation, but there'll be a non-legislative common framework. And of course, it also has potentially significant implications in terms of any potential trade uh, deals that are reached. Now, Julie, you mentioned in your opening remarks that, um, you know, much is staying the same in terms of the immediate administration of the process. But, uh, Councillor Everson, you talked about the possibilities of taking into account things like living wage and local supply chains. So I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more about the extent to which you think procurement policy will be able to be developed differently in Scotland from the rest of the UK. And to what extent, following on Councillor Everton's your remarks about subsidiarity, whether in fact you feel that council should be able to adopt different <coughs> rules to an extent around procurement? Yeah. Our position very much is that things should be decided at the lowest possible level. It's most effective for them, and they should be discussed at the most appropriate place. And obviously, councils, therefore, have, have a strong role in, in their local areas to do that. So, yes, I am arguing strongly for a, a, a position within these common frameworks for, for local government, that we need to have a voice at the table, we need to have our views put forward, and we need to be working very closely with the Scottish government and UK government where appropriate to, to push these things forward. Um, at, at the moment, we are following, obviously, UK public um, EU public procurement legislation, and there's a framework through that. Uh, there are... Um, maybe not many opportunities to come from the situation we're in at the moment, but what one, one opportunity that does exist is for the, the, the policies and procedures that we would like to have seen that are not currently able to do to be put into practice. Lots of local authorities supporting economic development in their own areas, which is obviously economic, inclusive economic growth is a key aspect of local authorities' work. And we want to do all we can to support that. And one key aspect of that would be having more ability to buy local, which obviously is not always possible at the moment with the current EU legislation. Uh, things like paying the living wage and through the community benefit clauses on procurement is 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 difficult at the moment in the way the wording has to be done, in the way it can, it can be done through procurement policies. If we're able to have a common framework that involves us a greater voice, we can, we can develop something that's more appropriate to, to our wishes in Scotland and what we are trying to develop. We are linked very closely. We jointly launched with the Scottish Government the National Performance Framework last year, and within that, fair work, living wage are key aspects of where we want to see Scotland going. Now, in our procurement that we're developing for developing into the future, uh, post, post where we are with Brexit at the moment, we would have the opportunity to do that and benefit all our communities and benefit that inclusive economic growth, which is a key aspect of our work. So, Julie, do you want to say anything about that? Um, yes, please. Uh, so, I, I would start by saying that I believe that Scotland is probably more further forward in terms of developing social, what I would call social procurement. Um, than the rest of the UK because of the, the laws that we have in place. Um, and that's based on discussions with 
uh, my peers in, in the rest of the UK who indeed come to ask and, us and ask, uh, how can we do this better? So I do think we've come a long way around uh, using the power of public procurement for, for social betterment in terms of uh, community benefits. In, in, the, in the living wage debate, um, although we haven't been able to make it mandatory, we've seen a huge increase in the number of suppliers that are willing to try and pay um, all of their staff the, the living wage and indeed become accredited. So, so all of the things we've done to date has made a difference. Um, I think that um, the changes ahead create an opportunity to make even more of a difference. Um, I always worry, I, I'm in councils every day because uh, they're, they're my customers and uh, they often say, um, the elected members will often say, why can't we just spend all our money within our council area? Um, and we show them actually how much economic benefits coming from the surrounding council. So whilst um, I'm wholly in favour of um, getting the, the maximum local economic growth for those council areas, I think we need to be careful about building barriers around uh, our own areas, because I think in some ways that can be detrimental in lots in lots of situations, um, the spend data supports that, so we need to be careful about that. But I do think that this creates an opportunity for, for us to forge ahead in the path that we're, we're already on, which is about using public uh, money for social good. So, so to be clear, Councillor Everson, you would like to see a procurement regime develop whereby different councils could apply, could have the flexibility to apply different rules? I think the key word in what you've said there is the flexibility. Yep. That, um, it, what's appropriate, what's helpful, what inspires and creates that inclusive economic growth. Mm -hmm. And obviously in different areas, that will mean different things. And different councils working with other different councils in the local area will, will come up with different solutions as well. And that's the point, again, of local decision making, I suppose, and subsidiarity and, and getting what is right for a particular area. And it's not precluding working with other authorities or selling services to other authorities, anything like that. It's about that flexibility to allow it to happen to a greater extent to the world which it is able to happen the moment. And is it your position that that flexibility is currently constrained by the existing procurement rules? There is an opportunity at the moment to, to take the rules further. As Julie has said in her answer, we've done as much as we can within the existing framework, within the existing rules. There's an opportunity to fly and go much further that I think we need to take um, for, for the basic economic growth of the whole of Scotland. If we're supporting inclusive local economic growth in local areas, we're supporting Scottish economic growth. So it, it's important to do that for, for all our benefits. Okay, so this is a good kind of microcosm, I suppose, of the wider mm -hmm. discussion about how to take forward these common mm -hmm. frameworks. So you made clear, you, 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 you were clear that you wanted local government to have a role in the uh, development mm -hmm. of such a common framework. Now, beyond the role that COSLA usually has it, it's consulted, it sits on working mm -hmm. groups and all the rest of it. We, just to be clear, are you talking about um, an enhanced role in decision making so that any future common framework should be subject to the sign off of local government? Just to be clear about what you mean by that. Yeah. At the moment, we have a very strong role through the Committee of the Regions within Europe. We have a key role in developing policy, and we have a, an input from the very beginning of, of an idea for a policy. We have an input through the Committee of the Regions to that at that stage, and it might be five years before it becomes policy, but we're there right at the beginning. We're putting ideas forward, and many of our ideas have been taken forward through that kind of mechanism. Um, it, it was the work of... Um, Cosler in Europe, for example, that argued for that things like Erasmus and Horizon were supported by the EU, and it was our argument at that stage that enabled that to, to get to the stage we are with those those kind of policies. So we've got that that situation already within Europe. We've got that influence on policy, and as it develops. I think those words again from Mike Russell, those words of no detriment, I'm going to quote those again because that's what we need to see moving forward. We it shouldn't we shouldn't be losing out from this process. We've got a key role. We've shown we're responsible. We've shown we under, have a wide understanding. We've shown we've got um, both elected members and officers who are able to work on these, these processes and take it forward for the greater good. And the system moving forward, the common frameworks need going forward should involve that as well. We've already got a good partnership in many levels with the Scottish Government that, that's developing, and it's to everybody's benefit that we have that. We saw it um, maybe in, in local issues as well last year, like the development of the 1140 hours, the involvement of local government in that meant that the policy was able to work. We need to make sure that we still have that role. So yes, I do think we need that strong role in the development of policy and the agreement of policy and the carrying forward of it. So 
just pursuing that a little bit, and other panellists are welcome to come in. Um, a non-legislative... What we're being asked as committees in Parliament by the Finance Constitution Committee uh, are our views on the role of Parliament, because we are committees of Parliament, the role of Parliament in the development of common frameworks. Um, and these common frameworks, obviously legislative ones, we will have a role, but non-legislative ones, it's a little bit less clear. So because procurement is a non-legislative common framework, um, the danger is it is it is agreed behind closed doors by ministers, um, and Parliament finds it difficult at the best of times to scrutinise um, uh, government where in relation to, to discussions with other governments. That, that's a difficult one for us to scrutinise because there's issues of confidence and all the rest of it. So do you have any proposals or ideas about how this non-legislative common framework should be developed such that your voice is an effective voice and indeed consider how Parliament's voice could be an effective voice as well? Or have you not thought about that? I mean, that's, that, that's what we're <laughs> yeah, grappling with, hey, hey. one of the... Uh, no, no, no specific ideas at the moment at this stage, but what is required is a joint discussion. We need to be at that table formulating. There's a lot of constitutional changes that we need to be brought forward, a lot of, of rethinking how we do business, how we work together. What we need is... is what the, what the UK government has promised us and not yet delivered, this, this consultative committee in which we, we can work together, we can sit down and, and evolve policies from the very beginning. Uh, we, we've had that... Um, proposed and we've agreed it from the UK level. We need that kind of work to be done in Scotland as well so we can have that kind of structure set up. It doesn't exist at the moment. Um, we need to work with officers, we need to work through the elected members to actually come together about what that can actually be. But at the moment, no firm proposals apart from the fact that we need need that discussion. Okay, and moving on to state aids, as I say, there's different... Sorry. Keep it, keep it short. As well. Okay. Very briefly, on state aids, there's a difference of views about who's got uh, competence to this, but putting that to one side, there will have to be some rules, there will be some rules to replace the existing ones. Um, how important are state aids in um, local economic development and the way you do business? Yeah, I think I can perhaps give some answer to that, uh, to the points raised there. Uh, uh, they are important because uh, a large amount of economic development activity that we do in local authorities, uh, well, all economic development has to be state aid compliant. Uh, in some cases, the aid we give is not considered state aid within the legal definition. In areas where it is, we have to comply with that. Uh, uh, two principal uh, instruments uh, through which we comply with EU state aids uh, legislation is the general block exemption regulation uh, uh, which covers a fairly wide range of activities and was reformed in 2014 precisely with the view to simplify the process uh, from the European Commission's point of view so that if the particular assistance complied with GBER it didn't need to be notified up front that this proposal to award aid was being done and this would focus therefore the capacity in DG competition to look at the big cases so the vast amount of state aid they anticipated would be dealt with by the provisions of the general block exemption regulation. Uh, local government uses that. Uh, uh, I think we've some eight or nine schemes that, uh, through Slade uh, that have been registered with the European Commission that allow us to do things like uh, uh, pay wage subsidies, uh, award training grants, and give support to small and medium-sized enterprises, invest in local infrastructure, uh, preserve the historic environment and culture. So there's a whole range of things. We have that. other agencies such as Scottish Enterprise have also their own raft of registered schemes under uh, this sort of particular piece of legislation. So it's a really, really important piece uh, of, of, of legislation. Now, the other uh, piece of legislation that local government in particular uh, uses uh, quite frequently is the so-called de minimis regulation, which basically allows a public authority uh, to award up to €200,000 over a rolling three-year period to any undertaking engaged in economic activity for any, any purpose subject to a few uh, safeguards. Uh, so these are the, the two sort of legal instruments that currently local government uh, use uh, and have to use in terms of the current legislative framework within which we operate. Just the other aspect that's important, of course, is that as part of the sort of family of EU 
uh, state aids policy, there is a thing called the regional aid guidelines, and it's the regional aid guidelines that determine how and what you can do within so-called assisted areas. Some of you may recall uh, that every so often, with every policy cycle the, in the recent past, there's been a review of the so-called assisted areas. This particular uh, impacts on mainly Scottish Enterprises' uh, regional selective assistance scheme. Uh, and this base, the, the policy designates the areas where such assistance can be awarded. It also says the types of firms that can be supported, and it also specifies what's called in the jargon the aid intensities. So that's a, that's a key part of that. It's not something that local government as such is directly involved, but it helps, for example, support our inward investment activities. We're wanting to attract uh, an inward, investment, inward investor to an area. Part of the package can very often be some of the support that could be made available through schemes such as uh, Scottish Enterprises, regional selective assistance. But these things are usually part of a much, much broader package of which the RSA grant is one, albeit important, component. So, so hope that gives you some flavour. Okay, that's uh, that's, that's, that's very helpful. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, right. okay, can Good morning. Can I, can I just pick up on Andy's point about the procurement? Um, because obviously we don't know the outcome of Brexit, and many hope that the outcome will be that we actually remain. So, given where we are, are, are you saying that currently? there are, as a result of European legislation, restrictions on local authorities being able to focus more on putting in clauses like local employment, employability, like the, the living wage. Um, is those restrictions there, or is it a lack of political will within local authorities, or a lack of knowledge and know-how that we're not seeing more of that? There, there is certainly political will to support economic growth in local areas. I would suggest right across the 32 authorities of Scotland, there is a political will to do what we can to support economic growth. Um, that is that's key. Uh, the community benefit clauses at the moment are in such a way that local authorities cannot always do what they want with them, and they have to be. As again, as Julie has answered, lots of companies want to deliver things like the living wage. They want to support that, but it's 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 dependent at the moment on them wanting to do it, and using their support to do so. At the moment, we don't have the the legislative ability to follow through everything we would want to do, and um, this is something that the current situation we're in should allow us to be able to do to improve the current situation to allow that political will to become reality. So are we saying that if, if we leave the EU, that opportunity is there, but right now it's not? Is that what we're saying? And has Scotland, Excel and COSLA done any work on this and produced any papers that say here are the barriers to, to putting in procurement policy that is much more socially and economically geared to local communities? Yeah, I mean, if, if I could answer purely from a, a Scotland Excel perspective, um, and member councils might have a different perspective, it should be said. So um, the main uh, probably restriction I think we have is around the living wage and the fact that we can't mandate it. Um, I suppose what, what I had said earlier was that the work we've done has definitely seen an increase. So it hasn't stopped us improving the situation, but if you wanted to change it completely, you might mandate it. So that, that's probably the one big change. Um, around the other social aspects, um, community benefits, it, it's a real mixed bag in terms of how they are applied. Um, in some cases, they're applied to the full extent and they work brilliantly, and in other cases, less so. Um, I think the legislation that we have um, is reasonably flexible to allow the, the, the types of things that we're talking about, but there's always room to improve on that. There's always room to do more, um, so this might create that opportunity. It, from a kind of national perspective, um, the changes in the law and over the last few years have allowed us to do a lot more uh, around community benefits, around sustainability, around the living wage, supported business, you name it. Um, so, so for me, it feels like you know we're quite we're quite a good bit down that <coughs> journey in terms of including the kind of things that we all want to see and getting the outcomes that we want. Um, but, but the openness, the transparency, the fairness that we have currently across Europe inevitably means you can't say, I'm going to always buy local. 
that's just not something that we're allowed to do. Having said that, there's lots of um, mechanisms that, that member councils use every day to try and buy locally. So not to get too technical, but we've got a thing called quick quotes for a uh, spend under 50k. Um, now, the, the law would allow you to only ask local suppliers to bid for that. There's, there's no rule against us doing that, and lots, lots of councils currently do that. So there are plenty of mechanisms at the moment. They are being used to varying degrees. We can do more with what we currently have. And indeed, um, I suppose we'd welcome an opportunity to see if, if this change allows us to do even more. But I suppose I, I feel that we, 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 we still have a way to go within what we currently have, personally, from a Scotland Excel perspective, that is. Because I read recently a paper on Preston Council yeah. and the work that they've done, not just as a local authority, but to bring a whole range of different organisations together to come up with a joint procurement policy that they claim, or the paper claimed, had brought uh, hundreds of millions of pounds of, of, of investment but, or kept it within the local economy. But, you know, it's what the barriers are. And, and back to my question, is, is there any papers being done that set out the barriers? No, not to my knowledge. Um, it's not something that we've been asked to do, so I'm not Can, can I also ask, do you believe that local authorities have the capacity? Um, you know, Cosla, Cosla arguing that, that they should have a, a far greater say, almost like the, the second tier a government uh, and, and, and a second chamber almost to the Scottish government have the, as a capacity there because when I look around Scotland I see major projects that have been procured and then cost the taxpayer an absolute fortune. The trams in Edinburgh, where we are now, in Fife, the Carnegie Centre. I could probably go into to many local authorities and see see procurement projects that have just completely got out of control. Is the capacity there for COSLA to take on even more work than, than, than you're doing at present, given, given also the financial restraints? Well, first of all, I correct the tears to spheres of government, that we'd like to see it to be a sphere of government, not not a, not, a, a, not, not consortive as tears, as an important aspect of what we're doing. I think the cap at the moment we have that capacity within Europe. At the moment we have this ability within Europe to develop policy, to get involved in aspects of work there. And we have officers working across in, in Brussels and in Strasbourg as well, doing that, that kind of work. So the capacity is there already. We're talking about uh, redirecting it because... If things develop in a certain way, we will need to do things more more locally within Scotland, within the UK. So there's a difference there. Of course, we know the budget restraints that local government is under, that um, the core budget has been reduced and we have less money. We have, as a result of that, less officers as well to work at a local government level. So there is obviously that background to the work as well. But we're talking about something here that would be bringing things within Scotland in particular. And we're talking about services that would benefit our local communities. If we're serious about that idea of, of empowerment, if we're serious about the idea of local work, uh, local governance, as um, has been developed jointly with... Uh, with Aileen Campbell as well through the Local Governance Review. If we're serious about all that kind of work, we need to put it into practice. And if that means um, better, convers different conversations when it comes to budget setting um, next year with Derek Mackay, then those conversations will have to take place. But we do need to do this work for the benefit of all our communities. I suppose the danger is people just wonder, are you doing that well at what you do before you start to take on more and more? But, but there you go. Thanks, Kevin. There you go. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. We've outlined this morning, or you've outlined to us, some of the challenges and some of the priorities that are taking place across the sphere in the preparation for uh, what may happen in, in the future. But can I ask about the opportunities that, that are going forward and the implications that there are uh, for the potential for further devolution in local government to take place across these common <laughs> frameworks? Where do you see that opportunity happening and, and how ready uh, are councils and local government for that process? 
I, I think this is a process we've been working towards since we had the Commission for, Local, for Strengthening Local Democracy, since all that work was done, all the arguments put forward there about subsidiarity, about transparency, about local democracy. That background work about what would be needed was done in 2014, I think, the, the year of that, that report, which was done as a cross-party basis, coming up through discussing with local communities the work that needs to be done. And I think that preparation has been being done since that time. We've um, done a lot of work recently thinking about the... Um, European Charter of Local Self-Government as well and how that would be implemented in our local communities and that work's being done as well. We've we've been looking at what that would actually mean in practice for our communities. Um, when, I hope I said when again, when, when that becomes a law within Scotland. So the preparation work is being done. Obviously, we're talking about adjustments having to be made. Uh, we're talking about changes in some practices and we're up for that. We're up for that because we're talking about those key ideas of subsidiarity. We're talking about local democracy. We're talking about local empowerment. We're talking about local economic growth. That's the key the goals that we want to achieve, and they are really important to us. That's the bed and butter of, of well, Cosdo and Work or government's work. So, yes, we're up for it, and we're willing to have that flexibility to deliver that change. And, and rightly so, you, you, you see it as a, an opportunity, an exciting opportunity for, for local government to develop and expand. Uh, but you've touched on today again, once again, about the capacity, uh, the budgetary implications that you have. Uh, that has obviously an effect on how progressive a council can be. And not all councils are at the same level or at the same stage. Uh, uh, so uh, would there be opportunities for certain councils to do things in a faster way, uh, in a, a more progressive way? Or, or, or should we once again see councils working together to try and devolve and to try and support one another uh, in trying to achieve that goal uh, for the communities that they represent? There are obviously 32 local authorities and they're all there's 32 different local authorities and there's even differences within local authorities. So yes, we do, we do have that background to work with and we do need to be aware of that. Councils already do work together, not only in COSLA itself, um, work, support from the Improvement Service, we've, we've got that structure already to, to encourage us to work together and councils have shared services where it's appropriate for them to have shared services and they seek to develop shared services in more areas as well. Yes, that work is already going on and that, that again is, is the nature of local government work and with all 32 councils, members of COSLA, we've got that opportunity to, to work and communicate and share good ideas. And, and through the Improvement Service, we have the local benchmarking framework as well, which helps, helps share good ideas, helps people see where things are working, reflect on their own practice. So that the, the, the basic work of that is happening. Um, yes, budget is an issue. But, you know, I think this is where we come back to what we actually want to achieve across Scotland. We want this Team Scotland approach. What do we want to deliver? What do we want to deliver for our communities, for all areas of Scotland? And we need, I think, to when we're looking at the budget, to think for, far more in terms of outcomes. And if these are outcomes that are important for all of us, if that national performance framework, which we all signed up to, really matters to us, we've got to make sure that the money is put there in order to deliver that. And this is really a way of uh, putting your money where your mouth is. You know, it matters. Matters. It matters to deliver this, and therefore we've got to be seen to do that. And if it's a priority, if the outcomes matter, the finance needs to be there to support okay. it. Okay. Okay. Any other members of the panel have views on? Yeah, yeah. Um, just, just a brief thing. Um, also, uh, in terms of capability and capacity, which seems to be a, a concern for the panel, um, from a procurement perspective and purely from a procurement perspective, councils have been assessed on their procurement performance for the last 10 years and, and they have been rapidly improving. Um, so it, it, it's true what you say, uh, councils develop and improve at different rates and that, that's clear in the, in the work that we do because we carry out the assessments. Um, but certainly when you, can when you compare where local government was in terms of procurement across the sphere of what we do, whether that's construction, care commissioning, general supplies and services, um, capability has, has increased quite dramatically over the last 10 years. That's not to say there's, there's not, again, room for improvement, and it's not to say that everybody's at the same level, because generally what we find is that the bigger councils who have invested in this tend to do better and are, and are better, but, but hopefully it gives some comfort for you to know that, that, that um, councils are doing a heck of a lot better at this than they were. Previously. Everybody else comes in. Uh, Kenny, you said you wanted you the point to raise on this. It's just the, the, the issue that Alexander was raising, and to, you know, in terms of uh, if common frameworks. I'm just wondering if, if the panel feels that there's any contradiction between the issue of common frameworks and subsidiarity. 
Um, I'm just wondering where the kind of clashes might occur, and I know the Scottish government has said it's committed to, to any quote not to to create divergent policies, but it's hard to see how that won't happen over time, just as a natural evolutionary process. So it's about where the where the, where the kind of boundaries lie, if you like, in a wee bit, and how to ensure that there is smooth kind of working without um, uh, without this happening. I think that. It's dependent on who's at the table in the first place and developing the common frameworks. Mm -hmm. I think I think we need to be at the table. I think that that's key to that. Yeah, well, and that, if yeah. you have if you have the right people at the table at the beginning and you have the right voices being heard and throughout the development of the policy you continue to have the right voices being heard from from everywhere, then then you get that voice anyway. And I don't see then a conflict. If you try and have something that's imposed from a gov um, Scottish government or UK government level on local authorities, then you do have a conflict with subsidies. I agree. But is there a commitment to that, to involving COSLA fully in terms of developing of these common frameworks? Well, is uh, that something you envisage happening uh, or is it something you are concerned about? I mean, you said, for example, yeah. your connections with the UK government are not as, as, as um, extensive as they perhaps could be and you would like to see. So is, do, you, do you have underlying concerns about that? At the moment, yes, it must be a concern because we've had the promise and yet we have seen nothing delivered in practice. So, yes, at the moment is a concern. We've been working very closely with the LGA, the Local Government Association in England, with the Welsh LGA and with NILJA, the Northern Ireland Local Government Association. All of us have been, been working because it, it's meant to be something for all of us to get involved in. We've been working at that level with them and we haven't had anything delivered yet. So at the moment it is a concern. But I think this is maybe something where Team Scotland needs to work together as well. Team Scotland needs to raise this is a key issue that we need to develop this together we need we need that kind of arrangement at the uk level but we also need to make it at the scottish level as well and you know there's an opportunity here for scotland to set an example to show what should be done what could be done and and get it right here in scotland and then uh, go back to the uk government with the promise they made they haven't yet delivered and just one further point if i can make convenient it's just a time scale is there any time scale for this that's been laid down? Because, I mean, I understand that the, the UK government had said that they would outline details of the Shared Prosperity Fund and how it would work prior to Christmas, and we're now at May. Uh, so there seems to be a, a, a real drag on this. Um, so I'm just wondering if, you, if, you, if you've got any indication as to when progress is likely to take place, A, on that, and B, in terms of development of frameworks. I don't know anything about progress because we're not involved. I don't know if Malcolm can come in on that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, just very briefly, yes, uh, you, you're quite right. We were expecting, we're all geared to have this sort of formal UK government consultation of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund before Christmas, and it didn't happen. Uh, obviously, it won't be happening any time in the next few weeks because there's a PERDA period uh, coming up. There's English local elections tomorrow, for example, which would prevent any launch of a, uh, uh, of a major initiatives such as UK Shared Prosperity Fund at that point in time, then there's the prospect, of course, of the European elections at the end of the month. So uh, we're not, therefore, expecting anything to come out over the next three or four weeks on that. Uh, based on some contacts I've had with colleagues down south and some of our sort of sister organisations with which I work, you know, you know, probably they're kind of waiting until there's some sort of clarity mm -hmm. on the overall Brexit package before they... Uh, they commit to the to launching the formal consultation, but we understood based on some uh, workshops at the, the Scotland office and the Ministry for uh, Housing Communities and local government conducted towards the end of last year that uh, you know the thing was more or less ready to ready to go once some of the broader uh, issues had there was some clarity on on that. Uh, but we don't quite know what the scope is, you know, how, to what depth it will go into sort of governance arrangements and decision making. These are really important issues, of course, but at the moment it's a bit of a big black box. Black hole, more like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Kavina. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Graham? Um, just, just sort of um, mopping up on some of the areas we, we've covered and, and, and sort of questions that I've got um, um, uh, around. Uh, uh, about the the spending restrictions on procurement, I th I think it will be useful. You may not be able to give us it today, but it will be useful to hear where where individual councils have wanted to do things and haven't been able to because of the existing rules. I'm not expecting you to give us a long list today, um, but Julie Welsh said that that there is the ability to um, use smaller contracts to spend locally. 
the implication of that is if you've got bigger contracts, you can't spend locally. So I'm thinking like maybe a school meals contract where you might want to buy local uh, but can't. So if we could have ex examples of that, and I think it was yourself, Councillor Everson, I think it was you that said there were 64 powers um, coming back to the UK that would affect local government. A list of those would be useful. Don't give us them now, but that would be interesting to see. Um, if I could, so that's just some work to go away with. Um, if I could ask about um, EU structural funds, and if you know, if you know the answer, sorry, I'm being uh, uh, heckled uh, from the side. Um, if if you happen to know um, how many, uh, 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 how much of EU structural funds is spent in local government in Scotland? That's a detailed figure for. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, very helpfully, your colleagues in Spice uh, produced a report on the deployment of European structural funds in Scotland just a couple of weeks ago during the Easter recess. Mm -hmm. uh, the figures, so that roughly, just between sort of, because uh, the chain, figures does change on a weekly basis as new operations are approved or existing ones are, to use the jargon, reprofiled, but roughly between 25 and 30 percent of the current uh, structural fund programmes in Scotland are awarded to local government as lead partners. Now, that's not to say all the money goes to local government. A lot of the, uh, the money that's awarded to local government is then recycled out to the third sector, for example, in relation to some of the poverty and social inclusion activities and also the employability, either through a local challenge fund mechanism or a procurement exercise, a secondary procurement exercise. But in terms of leadership, therefore, of the design of the, uh, the, the intervention operation, the local government share of the current programme is somewhere in the 25 to 30 percent bracket, if that's clear enough for you. Well, it gives me a percentage, but doesn't give me a figure. Again, the, uh, the figures are, if, uh, if I might refer to the SPICE report, uh, uh, was, was done on the commitments to date. I think that's what you're looking for rather than the overall uh, size of the budget. And I think they're contained uh, in one of the tables in, in, in the report. Uh, yeah, uh, so the, uh, at the moment, Program value, thanks, uh, Gordon. Is, uh, so committed in euros is just under 600 million mm -hmm. at the moment, uh, which is roughly about two thirds, which is uh, a little bit behind where we'd like to be at this stage in the program, but not, not, not disastrous in that respect. Uh, therefore, of that, therefore, the local government share would be somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of that figure in terms of leading an intervention. Though I would emphasize again that it doesn't all go straight into local government. Uh, coffers. A lot of it is recycled out to the third sector and the voluntary okay. sector uh, in our communities. Okay. Um, so, if we have this uh, shared UK shared prosperity fund, uh, if and when it's set up, and um, whenever we get the the rules around that, um, clearly one of the risks could be that you you, you get less money. Uh, but if you don't get less money, then do you see opportunities? For spending it differently. Uh, yes, I, I, I think the key to it is spending locally. That, ge that that regional element is crucial. Getting it spent within local areas, being being sensitive to what's needed in a, in a local area, is really really important. And the, the the good the big thing about the funds at the moment is yes, you have the financial amount, but the triggers they allow is really really important as well. Um, structural funds exist beyond a parliamentary term. And that's something that's a real benefit because you're able to do that longer term planning from it. Mm -hmm. So you're able to work with, with other organisations in a local area in a longer term. And I think that's something we mustn't lose. Uh, we, we shouldn't link it to a small period of time where you, you might get money for a bit and you don't know what's going to happen in the future. The structural funds transcend that and that's a key element. It encourages that partnership working that Malcolm was talking about as well with, with the third sector, with local partners, because it is more longer term, because it's got that sense. So we need to make sure that shared prosperity fund or whatever we have in future really does allow that kind of work to carry on happening and linking in the local area what what it depends what it what it works on will depend on what's needed in that local area the social the environmental the employability all those aspects will come from a particular local area but i, I 
But we do have that framework now with the National Performance Framework. We do have that framework for what we're actually trying to work up together to get somewhere and looking at what areas are missing in a particular area. Uh, uh, we've already commented that there's 32 authorities and they're they're doing 32 different things. They're, they work at different levels. Some, some are progressing in one area and are not progressing so much in a different area. Um, that local funding, that geographical sense is crucial. And to address whatever issues are important in that local area, we need to make sure that it carries on being able to do that. Anyone else? Welcome. Yeah, just a very quick point. Just... Uh, Yes, I mean, w one of the opportunities perhaps that does come with UK shared responsibility is perhaps to spend the money to at least to some extent on some things on slightly different uh, from what uh, the European funds have been doing. We're very, very constrained in terms of what the, the sort of in thematically in Scotland and indeed many other parts of the UK uh, and EU as a whole on what you can spend uh, EU structural funds on, particularly in the ERDF. 80% for a more developed region, which is what most of Scotland, that's, that is every, everywhere that's not in the Highlands and Islands, is, has to be spent on just four of the thematic priorities, innovation, ICT, speed development, and the low carbon economy. So anything else you might want to do on climate change, on transport, on social inclusion, right. has to come potentially from that just 20% uh, uh, available. So that's kind of a, a, a constraint we've had, and, it, and whilst at high level these look very attractive uh, areas to spend money, it's not the totality of what we want to do in local authorities in terms of economic development. And particularly, there's still a lot of stuff that colleagues uh, keep on uh, reminding me that we need to do on the sort of physical regeneration agenda, which has been kind of starved of resources, for which European money has made a big, big contribution in the 90s and the early years of, of, this, uh, of this century, but it's become increasingly difficult uh, to access that sort of activity to complement the, the people-based activities if we're serious about the, uh, the inclusive economic growth agenda. So okay. I guess I guess the, the the plea seems to be um, that local government should be involved in in setting the rules on this shared pr prosperity fund. So it should be uh, a, a bottom-up approach rather than it being top-down. Whether that's at, you, you know UK level or EU level, you want to be local government wants to be involved in in setting those parameters. And can I add to that? At the moment, we do have involvement. Get, we do get involved at the European level. At the moment, we do have that voice within the European Union through the Committee of the Regions and through people at, at MSP level and at, at Council level. Uh, we have Tony Buchanan, in particular, is very much involved in the work that's going on in Europe. Um, Andy himself and Mary Gujan are also very much involved in the work we've got in Europe through the Committee of Regions. So again, it is making sure that the voice we currently have in Europe, the strong voice of local government, um, I, I met with Michel Barnier myself uh, about 18 months ago now, and he was strongly arguing about the importance of local government. He himself sees it as a key aspect of, of, of what happens in Europe. He comes from the uh, local government background himself, and it is, is it fully committed to the importance of it, we need to make sure going forward we still have that role. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Can I just uh, thank you all for attending today's session, remind you to do your homework that Mr Simpson had uh, given you uh, before you leave. Uh, the committee will consider the evidence we've just heard in private at the end of this meeting, and thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, I suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table.
Agenda item three is consideration of negative instrument 116 as listed on the agenda. I refer members to paper number three. The instrument amends SSI 2019-40, which we considered on the 20th of March. That SSI miscounted by one the number of days in the current financial year, meaning that the formula it brought into law was slightly wrong. The sole purpose of this instrument is to correct this. The instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provisions will come into force unless the Parliament agrees to a motion to annul it. No motions to annul have been laid. Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the amended instrument at its meeting on 23rd of April 2019 and noted that it did not respect the usual requirements to be laid at least 28 days before coming into force. However, the committee considered the reasons for this given by the Scottish Government to be acceptable under the circumstances. The committee made no other recommendations on the instrument. Do members have any comment on the instrument? Andy? I think we just note for the record that Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and this committee um, over, overlooked the fact <laughs> that the number was wrong. <laughs> Mild rebuke for both of us. <laughs> yes. Uh, could we strike that from the record, please? <laughs> OK, if, if there's no, no other significant comments, then I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? Thank you. That concludes the public part of today's meeting, and I move the meeting now into private. <laughs>